Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Hello, everyone. Maya here, your host for today. I hope everyone had a lovely Easter break. Well, just before Easter, we saw some near record auction results as the property market continues to rally. Now, today, I'd like to welcome Ben Johnston, the Managing Director of Johnston Advisory. Welcome, Ben. How are you today? I'm well, thanks, Maya. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the SBI show. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. Now, Ben is an accountant, so he's not our sort of usual buyer's agent, uh, sort of the crowd that we usually chat to, but he's certainly not an average accountant. He has a 25 years plus experience in public practice, but he's also an expert in property investing and has been advising clients in investment structures and tax planning for decades. Now, Ben, tell us a little bit about your background. Where did that love of property come from? It really came from myself. I, I got into property investing at a really early age. I bought my first property myself when I was 21. But um, I've been advising clients for now 25 years, as you said before, and and I, and I always make property the cornerstone of my advice because it's so important on so many levels. One, for wealth creation through property, but it just opens doors for other avenues in investing too by having the leverage to use property as security, it helps in business and, like I said, other forms of investment as well. So I feel passionately that having a property in your portfolio is key. Mm-hmm, that's right. And Ben, tell me, so you were 21 when you bought your first, I think it was a one-bedroom unit for $140,000. Is that right? Tell us a little bit about sort of how do you make that decision at such a young age to sort of, you know, was it something that ran in the family that you saw your sort of parents do or...? I was actually kind of the opposite. Mum and dad are kind of humble beginnings and I and I was really ambitious by nature. So I wanted to do things my way and, and create uh, wealth in my own way. And, um, yeah, so it was with my wife and I. We, we came from similar trains of thoughts and, and that was the decision we made. I haven't looked back. Mm, exactly. And especially when you see that sort of price, $140,000, what can you get in these days for $140,000? I know. It was in Cronulla too. And oh, it, wow. So it's um, yeah, we only held that one for a short amount of time, and since then we've we've upgraded and obviously bought other investment properties and done things along the way. But it, it was a really good catalyst to start our journey within property. Yeah, and imagine how much that property would be worth today. <laughs> if yeah, it's in exactly. <laughs> um, If you don't mind sort of sharing with us just a little bit about sort of how your personal investment journey, I know that people sort of like to hear that, um, especially sort of from an expert point of view as well, how you sort of moved. Obviously, that first property, you sold that and then you went on to sort of buy a few more. How big is your portfolio? I own multiple properties at the moment, but the key of my advice to clients is where possible due to the tax advantages and so forth is to focus on your own home. So upgrading through your own property um, is where we've had a lot of success. And then with that comes, again, like I said, tax advantages and Mm -hmm. it's been key. So I've focused in on that a lot. And you say you're a strong believer in uh, that property should be the foundation for any personal asset portfolio. What do you mean sort of by that and why is that? I stand by that on a number of angles. One is that when you go to leverage, so when you want to start a business or you want to open an investment portfolio, whether it be with shares or property, the banks want to lend against physical security. So to have a property and build up equity in that property is really important to be able to leverage from. Also, just with people's confidence with property, it's it's a, maybe a generational thing. But I think even still with this next generation coming through, people like to own assets that they can see and that they can touch and, and possibly use as their own principal place of residence or a holiday home or whatever. I think they just feel generally secure with that. So I like to advise my clients that on that basis too. So they, they're having something that's stable. We've got obviously a relatively buoyant tenancy market too. So like the risk of having it untenanted, obviously subject to the area, is quite low. So they're getting an income stream that helps support holding that property as well. Mm -hmm. And what do you think that sets sort of property apart from, like you said, other equities and, you know, the stock market, for example, why do you sort of advise your clients to go into property rather than, you know, dabble in, in other areas of investment? Yeah, I guess, I mean, Australians are pretty passionate about property and then they, a lot of them follow property as a pastime. So I think without realising it, they're doing a lot of research without even knowing it. Whereas with shares, with shares, you, you really need to be either 
buying shares and sitting on them for a long time and go for the journey or really be researching and, and following it almost hourly the way it, it is at the moment. So I think property is something that kind of comes somewhere in between where you need to do your research, but it's also a long-term gain that you're hoping to make. And that's where I think that for people that are a bit risk averse, I think property is far and by way the best way to go. Mm, exactly. And like you said, property is an asset that is incredibly resilient. So tell us about those tax implications as being sort of a, an expert, obviously an accountant. I know that you're sort of, uh, you've been saying that you're a fan of having your own home primarily because it is tax free. Tell us a little bit about that sort of side of things and, and what are the tax implications of owning property and why is that sort of, you know, the right way to go? There's two streams. And I think firstly, with people get negative gearing wrong a lot. They, they've got this focus on, on sort of almost setting out to make negative gearing losses because they think that you get an enormous tax saving from doing so. My advice to clients is actually quite the opposite, where negative gearing is a bit of a fallacy unless you're getting capital growth. So I always give the example to people where if you're having a property, it's costing you $10,000 a year to hold. At most, you're going to recoup $4,700 in tax, but you're still out of pocket $5,300. So if your property hasn't grown in value, you're genuinely going backwards. So I think what people need to understand is that you've got to invest in property to make gains. Forget about the negative gearing. The tax that you recoup through negative gearing, sure, that helps, but that definitely shouldn't be people's motivation to buy property. Mm. And I feel like it sort of is in a lot of instances, it certainly helps make that decision to go into property investing. Oh, it definitely does. Like, again, it's one of those things I'm sort of talking about it to the negative, but if you're going to invest in property, then I suppose you have to look at the negative gearing benefits as a positive where it is recouping. But again, it's a bit of a fallacy. A lot of people think, oh, I've got tenants in there, they're paying my mortgage and I'm recouping tax refunds as a result of negative gearing. But when you factor in the rent they're getting and the tax that they're recouping, you're actually still going backwards through negative gearing. So that's why I keep going back to the same thing. You need stable and solid capital growth for property investing to work. Mm -hmm. And I think speaking of negative gearing, I think the major reason that ScoMo is in in um, in Canberra today and not <laughs> not the Labor government, because um, yeah. we do remember in 2019 that was sort of Labor's main uh, short and sort of main sort of campaign goal was to obviously remove negative gearing, wasn't it? Can you tell us a little bit sort of about? We saw in New Zealand just recently they announced that they're going to be eliminating some major tax benefits to property investors, including sort of their uh, equivalent of negative gearing, and that is to sort of curb the price growth that they're seeing over there. So Australia too is obviously undergoing a property boom at the moment, but it's nowhere sort of near sort of the New Zealand level. But do you expect the Australian government to one day maybe look at negative gearing and pay sort of yeah, more think, attention think, to I it? I think there's a few examples where they're actually already attacking negative gearing. I mean, the two obvious examples are one, they've taken the travel deduction away for investment properties. That was done mm. a couple of years ago. The other big change with depreciation deductions where they removed the Division 40 deductions, which is the deductions that relate to furniture and fittings and so forth when you buy a property that had been already preoccupied, like not, not an mm. actual brand new property. So th that's just a couple of examples where they actually have been sort of reducing the benefit of negative gearing already. I think one thing that they will probably look at and just speculating, and I think Labor did obviously propose it as well, is reducing the capital gain discounting on the sale of a property. Because when you think about it, outside of the benefits you get through the superannuation system, selling a capital asset with that 50% discount means that that's pretty much the cheapest tax that you pay in Australia, again, outside of superannuation, where, again, if you sell a property and you're in the highest marginal rate over $180,000, the most tax you're paying on that gain is 23.5%. Again, I'm speculating, but I would imagine the government's going to have a look at the discounting that is attracted to gains that you make on, on capital accumulating assets. Mm, that's right, Ben. And we're just going to take a very quick break and we'll be back in a second. 
And we are back uh, with an accountant this time. Ben Johnson joins us today to chat all things property, actually. So Ben is a property expert and he's just been giving us some advice around negative gearing and just uh, tax in general when it comes to property. Tell us, Ben, what are some of the other tax implications of property investing? Where else can sort of property investors benefit? Well, again, going back to depreciation, that is an enormous benefit for people with how it works for people that aren't aware of it. If you buy a property that's new or substantially new, you get to enjoy Division 40 deductions, which is basically writing off assets such as furniture, if if it's fully furnished, floor coverings, window coverings and so forth over their effective life. And then also you can get what's called a Division 43 deduction, which is the bricks and mortar, the actual building itself. So if you buy a property that's newish or brand new, then you're getting unbelievable tax deductions for something that's not costing you in terms of cash flow because it's embedded in the purchase price, but you're saving tax and clawing back tax when you're lodging your tax return because it's offsetting the rent. So that's really popular with people. The only thing that I'm sceptical about that is it it encourages you to buy a property which is new, which is great to encourage building, but you're also then coming with a higher purchase price, which is then requiring a higher level of debt and so forth. So again, you can't get blinded by just the depreciation deductions. You also want to stick to your core values on what makes you want to buy that property, which is one, having it affordable so you're not you're comfortable with the level of debt and you're also buying in an area that you're confident that there's going to be long-term gain over you're not just buying it because you're getting depreciation deductions Mm. if if it all comes together where you're buying in the area you want for the price you want and you happen to get these deductions then it's brilliant yeah, exactly. Um, and I know our property buyers, our buyers agents and buyers experts, they're sort of against those new properties just because it is a higher cost because of all the brand new sort of appliances and high tech things that these apartments contain, obviously. Sure. Um, and at times, you know, like older apartments can actually be sort of more sturdy. And, exactly. <laughs> and so it's, yeah, been it's ironic that some of these hundred year old buildings sort of look and hold together better than the ones that are knocked up really quite quickly too. So that's true as well. You're right. But there are a sort of a number of other sort of property expenses that buyers should obviously pay attention to that they can claim tax come tax time. So things like advertising, bank fees, charges, like things that sort of you don't generally think. So advertising means advertising costs. If you're sort of, you know, you're looking for a tenant and your tenant vacates, you're looking for a new one, then you obviously have to go through the whole advertising process. So things like that, right, Ben? Yeah, correct. So And then things like gardening and maintenance oh, as wow. well, like those costs people quite often overlook and it's quite obvious obviously if it's to do with the maintenance of your property and you're paying for it then like you say advertising for tenants annual package fees on loans are quite often overlooked they're they're usually upwards of four hundred dollars a year borrowing costs are a big expense that i've noticed when i inherit clients from other accountants that they overlook too so when you're if you have to incur lenders mortgage insurance or loan application fees and so forth they're actually tax deductible. The, the deductibility spread over five years. It's pro rata, but it's quite often a cost that's, that's not expense because it's overlooked. Mm-hmm. And so potentially sort of any costs that you have associated with that investment property, you can potentially claim come tax time. Yeah. I mean, there's a big distinction between what's capital. So things like mm-hmm. stamp duty and so forth aren't deductible when you mm-hmm. buy the property and the legal cost, they form part of the capital gains calculation later. But the cost to generally hold the property. So landlords insurance, contents and buildings insurance, obviously agents fees Mm. uh, and so forth. The big cost for most people is interest paid on the bank loan. I would like to say though, that this is one huge area of audit for the ATO. They've made it quite clear is that they're looking at people's repairs and maintenance claims because quite often investors get that really wrong where they're they're claiming the replacements of, say, dishwashers and hot water systems and so forth as expenses, but they are tax deductible. Mm -hmm. They're deductible through depreciation over their effective life where people are claiming them in error in full in the year that they purchase them. And and the ATO have made it clear that that's going to be an audit target moving forward. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to my next question, which is, I guess, how important is it for property investors to also sort of consider the services of an account? or a financial advisor, because we know that, you know, a lot of investors do go with a buyer's agent, they do use a mortgage broker, but I'm guessing that most sort of don't consult or throughout the whole process, they talk to an accountant and an accountant that does the accountant sort of have to have a knowledge of property like you do in order to sort of give you that best result? Oh, I think it's important that people engage an accountant before they dive into having an investment property, just so they actually get 
a true understanding on what the net cost of holding that property is going to be. Again, like I touched on before, there's a bit of a myth that the tenant's going to pay the mortgage and the tax you recoup makes it all worthwhile because it's all self-sustaining, but it's not the case. Like People need to budget in for a shortfall in their mortgage repayments. They also need to get the right advice on where their debt is, and this is what I advise clients a lot on making most use of offset accounts on their home loan because we see quite often, again, when we inherit clients that their debt's skewed in the wrong way. They'll have a bigger debt on their own home than they need to or should have and they've got a lot of equity in their investment properties which the interest is tax deductible on. So I think when people seek out the right advice early on, they can avoid some of those errors. So their debt is placed where it should be placed and they're getting the most tax advantage from that. Mm, that's right, Ben. And you mentioned earlier stamp duty. What do you think about sort of all the proposals around changing stamp duty, especially sort of in New South Wales, where we've seen the government sort of, you know, talk about a property tax overhaul? What are your thoughts? I think about it a lot, and it's quite hard to get any sort of level of detail on the application mm. of it. But being realistic, the government is always going to win. So I mm. used an example with a friend the other day, whereas if you buy a property for a million dollars, the stamp duty is roughly going to be forty odd thousand dollars. So if they they'll obviously annualise it with a, an equivalent annual stamp duty slash land tax, however they brand it. But you think if you depending on what that figure is going to be, I would assume if you hold that property for any longer than say. 12 or 15 years, the government's going to win because the amount of that annual payment, it's going to far outweigh what the property land, the stamp duty paid on that property purchase would have been at the time. So it'll become a bit of a game on how long, for that reason, how long you hold a property, whether you win or lose from the proposed changes Mm. in stamp duty that way. But if you hold a property for 20, 30, 40 years, there's no doubt that the government's going to recoup a lot more money out of that property than they would out of the current stamp duty regime. Again, that's subject to how much they raise this levy to be. Mm, that's or right. And uh, and I'm sure given sort of, you know, we've now come sort of through COVID and uh, all the government stimulus measures that each of the states uh, ran as well, and I'm sure they're not looking to sort of, you know, to empty their wallets even further. So it is going to be something that's going to definitely benefit them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I definitely. It'll be interesting to see how the transition works because they're so reliant. They literally, New South Wales alone recoups billions and billions of dollars they can't just turn that tap off so it'll be really like long term they're definitely going to win but that transition period is going to be really interesting to see how that's implemented that's right and just in february actually uh new south wales uh, actually they had a record stamp duty haul so it was at 816 million just in feb alone so (laughs) It's, it's unbelievable the one interesting thing for me is that is the effect on property prices i mean there's all this sort of pressure or like the Reserve Bank is well, rates are so low and then there's talk about a pressure on APRA to try and increase the requirements for lenders, which I find hard to believe because then the banks are going to not be lending money and they we need a robust banking system to keep the country going forward. And I just think with, and again, like I think you said when we first started talking, the property prices have just gone mm. absolutely berserk in the last well, the first quarter of this year. But if you remove stamp duty out of that equation, I don't think it's going to help affordability. Like you have someone bidding in an auction on a place for $2 million, they're just going to go $100,000 higher because they don't have the stamp duty cost to incur. I don't think that's going to, I don't, I mean, the government's saying that that's going to help ease the pressure on first homeowners. I kind of disagree. Because I think, if anything, people are just going to spend more. You're seeing it now. Every $100,000 that people are spending on a property, they're looking at it where it only costs them $2,000 a year to service with rates at 2%. So you're standing at an auction on a place for $2 million. People are going to go an extra hundred dollars or $200,000 more because they're annualising it to be two or $4,000 a year. And again, it's just, that's where things, in my opinion, are ballooning out of control just because the cost of money is so cheap. That's right. And you just mentioned first home buyers as well. And just going back to sort of your story, you know, at the age of 21, buying a property for 140000 I know that, you know, back then, obviously, uh, wages were probably, you know, a little smaller than now, but not that much, probably not when you compare the, you know, the value of that property today. No, I think to that's wages. where baby boomers love to say that, <laughs> where I was paying 16% interest. But I would happily pay 16% interest if I was buying a house for $100,000. Exactly. 
So it's fine when they're sitting on a $3 million property and they're saying, well, rates are 2%, it's all relative. It's so far from relative. We Mm. haven't had like solid wage growth in this country for a long, long time. So I think that whole rhetoric is so out of line. I just think Mm. affordability for young people or people new to the market it's still achievable. I hate when people give up on it because you can do it, it feels if you pretty, really want to do it. It feels pretty impossible sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. <laughs> if if you, you want to buy in a place where you want to live, you know, if you want to stay close to work, it's pretty tough, yeah. Yeah, for sure. But I think it's doable. If you give up, you're never going to get it though, are you? I think you, you still need True. to have the goal and, and try and And it's definitely not easy and it's definitely getting harder and harder, but I don't think it should be something that people give up on at all. Mm, Exactly. And we're just going to take another quick break and we'll be back in a second. And we're back with Ben Johnston, the Managing Director of Johnston Advisory. We're just chatting through the tax implications of property investing and also just the general affordability of Aussie real estate at the moment. So, Ben, just going back to our conversation just before the break, I know a lot of people sort of, even just last year when the prices were sort of expected to go down drastically, which never actually happened and people were waiting for that right chance to buy and then all of a sudden the prices started to spike again and now they're just soaring. And I imagine that a lot of young people are also now sort of deciding to exit the game and wait for the next drop. Do you sort of foresee any sort of declines in the near future or is this boom expected to last for the next few years? Yeah, I was really bearish through the COVID period, as were a lot of people, mm. just because of there was this so-called cliff when JobKeeper and people had their mortgage holidays, which were all due to expire. And then that can was kicked down the road until pretty much now a lot of mortgages come off their holiday period now. I've totally changed my mind now, I think, just seeing this momentum that it's still got a lot of steam left in it. While interest rates are so low, Australians, like, again, this new generation, they they seem to have an insatiable appetite for debt and the the level of debt that they take on doesn't seem to scare them. Rightly or wrongly, I think that that's just the norm of the way that the property market's going to work now. So I can't see steam getting taken out of Mm. it for for at least another 12 to 18 months. There's such pent-up demand as well. It's not going to just change overnight. So I I think that there's still definite gains to have. How that looks in the long term, I mean, doomsdayers have said that property is going to crash for so long now and those people that sat on their hands, I'd hate to be them now because how are they ever going to get in? So I, I think with this you've just got to go for the ride. I mean, be tactical, don't overcommit, do your research, but at the same time, you can't always forecast this imminent crash because you, the way things are going, you're never going to be able to get in. Mm, that's right. And then what happens, I think a, a worry is as well, when the migrants start to return to Australia, we know that they sort of love to own their own property and then a majority sort of within the first couple of years do buy a property and then they do look for sort of the more central and most of them go to Sydney and Melbourne. So what happens to prices when that extra demand sort of reaches yeah, our I agree with you. I think that would be, it's a given. Our population is going to increase massively. Mm. We've got a trillion dollar debt to service and servicing it with 25 million people is difficult. And as a country, we need to grow anyway. We need to grow our employment base and so forth. So I think your point is perfect. I think immigration will rise and then we've already got a supply demand issue with our current population. You add another five or 10 million people into the country over the next 10 to 15 years and it's only a beginning. So with that mm-hmm. is the positive stuff where you've got to think, there's a lot of foundation there for property to at least hold value, if not grow even further, where you've got even more pressure for supply and demand. So, yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly with that. Yeah. And I was speaking to a property expert just recently who sort of said, you know, once the markets do come to Australia or once the borders do open, it's going to be, again, Sydney, Melbourne that are going to grow. And then obviously Perth with sort of the mining boom revival. But this sort of, I asked about Brisbane and he wasn't sort of too sure about Brisbane because Brisbane doesn't sort of have that one. It doesn't stand out. So, you know, you've got the financial centres, Sydney and Melbourne, you've got the mining in Perth, but Brisbane sort of doesn't have its own, own identity, if I can yeah. say that. Know, well, what fun. do you think about Brisbane? Do we need to sort of, you know, we need some sort of manufacturing plan up there or something to bring the people over up there? Oh, definitely. I think like looking at the bigger picture, I think how we've handled ourselves as a nation through COVID, I think we're going to be really desirable for immigrants and, mm. and for people repatriating back to Australia. And as a nation, we really need to capitalise on that. We need to encourage big businesses 
to form bases here and encourage employment. And I know a lot of people always say, oh, big businesses pay lower tax and whatnot. In my opinion, I think that's a great thing. We need employment here. And and if it's places like Brisbane and so forth Mm -hmm. where that has to happen, I think that Brisbane need to do that. I mean, from all accounts, I mean, it's been debatable whether it works or not economically, but the the next Olympics or one of the next Olympics Mm, coming up is going to be in Brisbane as well. So with that, the government pumps in a lot of infrastructure. I mean, the Gold Coast and South East Queensland generally is becoming like the Florida of Australia where a lot of people from Sydney and Melbourne that are cashed up are going to retire there. So where historically that South East Queensland market is yo-yoed, through time, it seems to be, in my opinion, it's got a better probability mm. to at least hold firm, if not keep growing, where people want to migrate up that way. Mm, exactly. So maybe tourism or something is the way to go to sort of, you know, for Brisbane to become sort of the tourism centre of Australia. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Or even like I just think, I mean, the world's not going backwards from technology. I think mm. in terms of encouraging people to start up tech firms and so forth. I think that's an absolute no-brainer for emerging cities to focus on. Mm, That's very true. I was just actually looking into this new NFT, this new trend that's going around the world that uh, all these people sort of buying these digital assets for these huge amounts of money, but they're not actually getting the physical thing. I don't know if you've heard about it. Yeah, I saw that. It was interesting. I saw the guy from Twitter sell his original his original tweet that's right yeah and so property is becoming a thing where they're sort of you can buy major landmarks around the world but i'm not sure like you don't actually own them obviously so what you own i'm not quite sure about but just speaking about tech and startups the world is it's evolving it's sort of hard to keep track of everything that's going on at the moment in that space um but just returning to property ben what are some of those risks to property investing and we've been sort of talking about the upside but obviously there are some of those risks, especially when it comes to, I guess, that buying process. If you do decide to do it alone, how do you sort of pinpoint what a good investment is, what isn't, where the hotspots are? Also, a lot of people sort of forget that you need to be in property for the long run. It's not like, you know, I buy a house now within two years, I'm going to be a millionaire. Yeah, you know? yeah. So tell us <laughs> about some of those risks. Yeah, so I personally always advise my clients to look in their own backyard, you know, what streets are good and bad and the difference in one street can mean the difference in desirability. So if you just go start speculating on a town or a city that's going to go well and you're not really too familiar with it, I think you've got an inherent risk there of doing the wrong thing. I think that, yeah, again, I stand by that massively and that's um, proven to be quite successful. I think in terms of risk with property generally, I'm always sceptical if you sit in front of an advisor other than a buyer's agent, it's different because you're seeking them out to go and find one. But if you're sitting with a financial advisor or an accountant and they're selling you a property, I'm always sceptical on that. Mm. I've seen nothing. Any property that I've seen go bad has been on the back of that. And that's because that decision has been driven through the self-interest of the advisor knowing that they're going to get commissions out of it. So they're kind of taken away the independence, looking at their own motivation and then for the investor, I don't think that sits well with me at all in terms of that. I think people should own it. I think they should research it themselves. I think they should seek advice from an accountant and, and maybe chat to a financial planner. But I think they've got to take ownership on what they buy and, and where. And, and like you said, there is no quick gain in property. I mean, there mm. is there's spikes in periods like this where you can do it. But realistically, you should be holding a property for 10, 15, 20 plus years and going for sustained growth. So you're riding through the ebbs and flows of the economic conditions that sit below it as well. So, yeah, I think that that's key, just buying where you know. Mm, Exactly. Thanks, Ben. And also just in terms of, you say, long-term, so would you sort of advise, you know, someone going into, say, buying a property now and then within, say, 10 or or five years, property spikes again, should you sell or do you wait it out? Like when, how do you sort of make the decision when to sort of, what to do with the... I I I come (laughs) across this dilemma a lot and it's to do with where your debt is, like I was touching on before. So where people, like quite often a common transition is a young couple, for example, buys their first home, townhome unit as their footprint and they're living in it. And as we established before, it's they can make exponential profit and it's free from tax. Quite often the dilemma comes where they say, well, I actually want to keep that first property and buy 
now a home, so upgrade to a more expensive property or bigger land and so forth. But the dilemma comes with that where you can actually end up with your debt in the wrong spot in that if you, say, buy your first property for 500000 it's now worth 800000 and then you want to buy a house for $1.2 million, and your equity is in your first property and you're forced to borrow $1.2 million on the second property that you're living in, your debt's going to be skewed where your tax deductible debt is lower than what it should be and your non-tax deductible debt, which is attached to your own home, is higher than what it should be. So quite often you see people with their hands forced where they to try and avoid that scenario, they sell their first property to buy their home, shift their equity across into their own home and then perhaps go and buy an investment property there so you can actually shift your debt around. The problem with Australia, and unless they solve this stamp duty issue, is that the cost to buy and sell property is obviously very high. Sure, there's no capital gains tax on your own home, but you have to pay stamp duty, agents, fees, legal costs and so forth. So you can't make a decision like that lightly. It's got to be part of a bigger picture, but that ideally that, that's what has to happen when you're upgrading your own home. Mm, exactly. And any final advice, Ben, for our property investors? I just think people with what's going on, like I, I said before, shouldn't lose hope. I think if you save or if your parents are, are willing to help you out, which is quite common to give you a leg up, I don't think people should give up. I think people should go in with their eyes open. Yeah, things are going up at a rate of knots, but I don't think people should get caught up in the whole FOMO thing and think that they have to dive in right now. Again, property should be over a long period of time. So if they wait six or 12 months till they get their finance in order, they get their savings to where they want to be, I don't think it's too late for people as mm-hmm. well. I think if anything, people rush in too quick, they're going to buy a, a property they wouldn't otherwise have going to buy just so they can say they've bought a place or they feel like they're onto it. I think people should still be patient with it. Mm, that's certainly very good advice. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Ben. You're welcome. Full of great insights. <laughs> And thank you to our audience for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast. I'm sure that you got a lot out of it. Ben certainly is, you know, a property expert as well as an accounting expert. So yeah, thank you for joining us again and I'll see you next time. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.